Hello, welcome. So uh, my name's uh, Alex Kirkop. I'm an architect at Akamai and co-chair of uh, the storage tag for the CNCF. Um, and I'm here with my two co-chairs, uh, Xing and Rafaela. Do you want to quickly introduce yourself? Hello, everyone. Xing Yang. I work at uh, VMWell in the Cloud Native 3 team. Also a co-chair of Tech Storage. And my name is Rafael Spassoli. I am an architect at Red Hat. So we're here today to talk about the storage tag, but also a little bit about the storage landscape in the CNCF. Um, about 350 people signed up for this, but there's obviously not 350 people here, so we're going to tell you how exciting storage is, and hopefully you can tell everybody else too. Um, so just a little bit about what we're covering today. We're going to talk a little bit about the tag, how you can help and uh, join in the community, what is cloud native storage, and some of the documents, um, and point you to some links that provide uh, additional information uh, about the work that we've been do doing. So, first off, the CNCF um, has been expanding uh, the, the, the roles effectively to allow it to scale to the large number of projects that have been. Uh, coming in and joining the CNCF, um, and so the tags or the technical advisory groups um, are here to 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 help provide um, uh, subject matter expertise. In this case, for the storage space, uh, to to the CNCF's talk, we have meetings um, every second and fourth Wednesday of the month. All the meetings are open, um, and on every slide where we have some links, please uh, take a quick pick of the QR code, and that will take you to to the repo that we're talking about. Um, so who are we? Well, you've met the co-chairs. We're, we're up here on stage. We also have um, a number of uh, tech leads that help with, uh, that, 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 that work with, with us and with the rest of the community, as well as um, some talk liaisons who's, uh, for storage is uh, Nikita and, and, and Matt Farina um, in our case. Um, so what do we do? The, the, the main idea for creating the tags was to be able to, to scale what the CNCF uh, is capable of as we increase the large number of projects uh, within the environment. So what we're, what we're, what we're here to do is uh, effectively create um, content and uh, white papers, etc., to help uh, provide guidance to the community as to the ecosystem and, and how to best uh, use storage. We also have a very important role where we review um, projects within the CNCF and guide them through the sandbox uh, incubation and, and graduation stages. You'll, you'll have seen some of the graduated projects in the keynote this morning. Uh, and of course, we, we, we work with the user community and, and provide that subject matter expertise. So I wanted to quickly touch on some of the CNCF projects which um, we have been working with and, and which have been going through the process. So starting with, with incubation, we have uh, Dragonfly, which is, which is a peer-to-peer -peer registry, KubeFS, um, a, a large-scale um, shared file system, and Longhorn, that provides a distributed uh, block and, and file system capability to running in Kubernetes. And we also have a large number of graduated projects that, that, that fit under the storage umbrella. Of course, you'll all have heard of etcd, which is the strong consistency key value store, which most, uh, which, which all Kubernetes uh, um, uh, clusters depend on. But we also have uh, really interesting scale-out uh, key value stores and databases like TIKV and Vitesse, as well as Rook, which falls into the operator umbrella. And, and Jing is going to be talking a little bit more about operators in a minute. Um, and Rook uh, acts as an operator for Ceph, so providing uh, file system uh, block and object store. And we also have Harbor, which is, um, which is a uh, container registry project um, for, uh, for, for deploying your own private container registries. So a little bit about the different categorizations of, of the projects and, 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 and how you need to think about these. So there are a large number of projects that come in as sandbox. Sand, sandbox projects have a fairly low bar to entry, and, and the idea is for them to join the CNCF so that we can um, help grow them, help evaluate experiments, help build the community, and, and also you know, figure out uh, their, their IP policies um, uh, within, within the community. 
And as we progress, as, as the project get, gains traction, they go to incubation stage. So incubation is actually, uh, despite the name, it's, it's where a lot of the due diligence happens. So at incubation stage, we um, figure out uh, real life use cases, the tag and the TOC interview, um, real life end users that are using the project. Um, and, we, and we therefore get you know, a, a healthy level of validation that the project is doing what it's doing and is actually being used in production and has and is a certain level of maturity and stability. Um, and then finally we have uh, graduation. And, and graduation is, up, is, is, is like a final step where we have um, additional governance controls in terms of the, the maintainers and the number of maintainers from different organizations. But we also, uh, but the CNCF also um, pays for independent security audits and, and, and gets those any, any security issues that are identified fixed before, before it gets to that graduation stage. So, so graduation means it's being um, verified and validated in use in production in a number of large organizations and has a nice solid roadmap with, with, a, with a healthy maintainer base and a healthy governance. So, we're here to talk about cloud-native storage and why we should think about this. So I'll go out there and maybe step on a landmine and say there is no such thing as a stateless architecture, right? Um, at the end of the day, every application is going to store state somewhere. And whether it's um, services within Kubernetes where you're storing state, or services outside of Kubernetes, those need to be managed and orchestrated uh, in, in, in our environment. And, and, the, and, and the reason that this is important is because all of the benefits as, as, as enterprises and organizations go through their cloud-native um, roadmap and their cloud-native journey where they adopt co uh, containers and they adopt uh, orchestrators like Kubernetes, the next step is obviously to take advantage of all of those benefits like the automatic healing and automatic failover and, and, and the performance and scaling capabilities and apply that to stateful workloads too. And at this stage, we have a very broad ecosystem that supports uh, cloud-native storage, um, CSI support uh, and COSI support in, in, in Kubernetes, and we have a, a, a lot of operators for databases, message queues, and, and almost every other thing you can think of. And it's important to recognize that when we talk about cloud-native storage, we're not just talking about you know, volumes and file systems and block and, and object, but we're also talking about key value stores and, and, and databases and that sort of thing too. So in order to kind of demystify and detangle this, this environment, we put together the CNCF storage white paper. Again, there's a QR code there that will take you to the link. Um, and in the white paper, we try to go about things by, by, by explaining the, the attributes of a storage system and the various layers that, that form the topology of that system, but also defining how the data access parts and the control plane work in the Kubernetes environment. So some of the storage attributes that we focus on or, or the key ones that we focus on in the white paper are, are, are these five here. So availability, scalability, performance, consistency, and durability. Almost every storage system aspect can be linked into one of these attributes. And it's important to understand these attributes in terms of how it relates to your application because each of those attributes can be measured across a number of different criteria. So for example, when we talk about performance, some applications need to do lots of operations per second. Some applications need to do, um, uh, some applications are more throughput focused and other applications might be very latency focused, for example. And the same goes for things like availability where the ability to fail over and moving uh, data between nodes and the amount of redundancy and data protection is also critical to your application, but of course, each of these things um, are compromises against each other, right? So um, the, the higher um, consistency uh, commitments or higher consistency guarantees will affect performance and scalability concerns may also affect aspects of availability or performance or consistency. So these, these things kind of all interrelate and they also interrelate with, with all of the layers. And I'm not going to sort of read through every single one of these layers, mostly because I just want you to focus on the fact that most storage systems today um, are actually built using a number of different layers. And that is also key to understanding the attributes of the storage. So for example, 
you might have a file system that is built on top of an object store. So for example, we, we now have uh, a system that has the shared attributes and the scaling attributes of a shared file system, but it also has the scaling and the latency and the uh, other attributes of an object store that, that underpin that system. Um, and why this matters is, is kind of evident if you look at a couple of sort of use cases or examples um, it, out of the many that, that, that we see in, in the storage world. So I'll just pick on a couple of these to give you those examples. Like in the case of hyperconverged, for example, we look at the availability attributes and we see that we're merging the fault domains and change management domains between compute and storage. So now compute failures can relate to storage failures and, and vice versa. But obviously, we also see um, uh, an impact on the performance attributes in terms of the shared network between the, uh, between the storage and the compute. And when we look at block volume, so you know, think about things like uh, EBS, for example, which is an obvious uh, use case here that everybody will be familiar with. The main idea here is to disaggregate the storage from the compute. Um, and therefore, when we look at this, we need to see how easy is it to connect those volumes to the, to the compute nodes and, and move them around when we look at availability concerns. But also, you know, we look at this from a performance point of view. So typically, these sorts of volumes might have the lowest latency, but they also need good connectivity between the storage nodes and the compute nodes. Similarly, um, shared file systems can now be used by multiple nodes at the same time, but using uh, a shared file system across multiple nodes at the same time leads to challenges with consistency and how you deal with cache coherency and distributed locks, for example. Um, and obviously, we also talked about those layers and, 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 and the fact that, that you know, the underlying layers for these file systems can also depend, can also affect the attributes. And, and finally, something like object stores, which are very appealing from a scale point of view, almost infinite for capacity and, and throughput, um, but typically you know, suffering from higher latency than, than, say, a file system or a block store. Um, and, and in this environment, uh, requests per second is often the, the, the bottleneck that you kind of need to, to uh, determine. So I'll pause here and hand over to Jing, who's going to talk a little bit about um, the data on Kubernetes white paper. Thanks, Alex. According to the 2022 survey by Data on Kubernetes community, more and more data workloads are moving to Kubernetes. As shown here, there are different types of workloads. Uh, database workloads have the highest percentage, followed by analytics and machine learning. We also have streaming, messaging, and CICD. And the underlying storage used by this data workloads could be block, file, or object storage. Stable workloads move to Kubernetes to take the advantage of Kubernetes self-healing ability, uh, agile deployment, portability, and scalability. We are collaborating with the uh, uh, Data on Kubernetes community on a white paper to describe the patterns of running data on Kubernetes. The paper is complete and it has been in review. In the paper, we are uh, describing the attributes of a storage system and how they affect running data on Kubernetes. Uh, we compared running data inside versus outside of Kubernetes, and we describe the common Kubernetes features and patterns being used when running data on Kubernetes. And in the first version of the paper, we are focusing on databases, uh, although the things we talk about will apply to other type of workloads as well. Storage system has attributes as described in our landscape white paper. Uh, for cloud native databases, the type of uh, backend store used, the number of replicas, all will have an impact on the attributes such as availability uh, and durability. A cloud native database typically uh, uses uh, sharding to facilitate horizontal uh, scaling. For example, Vitas is a graduated CNCF project. Uh, it has a built-in sharding feature to facilitate uh, horizontal scaling of the MySQL databases. 
And here we also have uh, observability and elasticity. In a cloud native environment, typically there are lots of microservices running in a distributed fashion. So if something happened, it is hard to uh, find out exactly which component is causing the problem. So it is even more important to have a comprehensive observability system built in so that we can detect problem early and prevent failure from happening. And elasticity refers to the ability to scale up and down quickly. This is the on-demand infrastructure where you can release resources when they are no longer needed. This also refers to the tiering, uh, storage tiering, where you can move your data across different tiers depending on how often they are accessed. And for DR, Rafael will talk about that in detail later. There are options to run data inside versus outside of Kubernetes. Managing databases without proper automation is not a pattern that is recommended. So that means we have mainly two alternatives. We can use managed database services provided by most cloud providers, or we can run data inside Kubernetes. And that is typically facilitated by an operator. An operator uses uh, the declarative API of Kubernetes and reconciles the desired state versus the actual state. An operator can automate day two operations such as backup and restore, upgrade, migration. An operator can also leverage third party tools like uh, Prometheus and Grafana for monitoring and so on. So here we have a a uh, Kubernetes operator that deploys and manages a database cluster. And the database cluster is typically uh, defined in a customer resource, a CR, uh, that describe what type of uh, cluster user wants. That's the desired state. And the operator reconciles the desired state defined in the CR spec uh, against the actual state of the cluster. So here, the database cluster uh, is running as a stable set with uh, three replicas. Each replica has a pod that uses the persistent volume to store data. The persistent volume is provisioned by using a CSI driver, a CSI container storage interface that defines common interfaces for a storage vendor to write a plugin so that the underlying storage can be consumed by containers running in Kubernetes and the other container orchestration systems. According to the DOK survey, uh, an organization typically uses more than one operator. As shown in the operator hub, I have a screenshot here, there are more than 300 operators. Among them, more than 40 are database operators. And there are uh, two CNCF graduated project listed there, the EVCD and uh, Vitas. Uh, there are nine Postgres SQL operators, including Cloud Native PG. Cloud Native PG is an open source operator that manages a Postgres SQL uh, database running in a primary standby architecture in Kubernetes. Uh, although uh, operators are widely used when running data on Kubernetes, there are a lot of challenges, including lack of standard. That's why the DOK community is working on a operator feature matrix, trying to define uh, standardized and vendor neutral feature matrix for the operators so that it will be easier for user to choose an operator. When running data in Kubernetes, there are lots of uh, common patterns and features used. We already talked about the operator and CSI. And topology OS scheduling is also a uh, common used feature. Uh, you can define node labels where the key is the topology key, and the Kubernetes scheduler can use that to spread the pods across different failure domains. And together with the topology where dynamic provisioning, 
your persistent volumes can be provisioned to the filial domains where your parts are scheduled to. So that's all I want to cover for the uh, DOKY paper. Let me hand it over to Alex. It's not like we didn't rehearse this. Okay, so um, I'm just gonna spend a couple of minutes um, to focus on uh, one of the white papers that we've been working on, which we're, we're hoping to finalize. It's been, <laughs> it's, it's, it's had an extended review period. Um, one of the things we looked at when we were looking at the, the different attributes in our uh, original storage white paper was lots of questions came up around performance. Performance seems to be one of, the, one of those things that, that people find difficult to understand. And actually, when we started putting this white paper together to, to define some of the concepts for how you measure uh, performance and how you benchmark uh, things like volumes and databases, the, the common and recurring theme was actually it's it's so easy to 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 get things wrong and and, and so easy to um, to to uh, to be challenged when you when you're doing these sort of benchmarkings that, that a large part of the document is is trying to determine is trying to define those best practices that that are used uh, during performance and and what we look at is trying to trying to match some of the some of the things that that actually matter when, when we're looking at this. So differentiating, for example, between um, the operations per second versus the throughput, which, which different storage systems are, are, are often optimized differently for those, for those two specific uh, criteria. So for example, if you want to do lots of transactions in your app, then you might want uh, to have lots of operations per second, but if you want to do, say, you know, analytics or, or machine learning, for example, you probably need to focus on, on throughput type options. Um, and of course, as we talked about with the layers, things like the topology and the way that uh, data protection like replicas or erasure coding is implemented, the data reduction like, like compression and encryption, that matters. But ultimately, in most of the discussions, um, people need to see the, need to measure the latency more than almost anything else. Like that is often the biggest determinant between, um, between the, the, the performance benchmarking. And, and this kind of leads to how you build out and scale out the concurrency in these systems, both in terms of, you know, the queues to individual um, APIs or, or, or volumes, et cetera, but also like how many clients and how many backends the, the systems can scale to. And of course, one of the biggest gotchas is that in systems with lots of different layers, caching happens everywhere, all the way from, you know, the physical media uh, to um, the, the the operating system to the file systems and, and and everything in between, and and therefore always be very very critical when you're looking at the numbers and make sure you you we understand what we're actually me measuring, because the number of times we've seen, you know, benchmark results being um, being published in blogs and things like that, which which are obviously incorrect, because they're, they're talking about um, uh, crazy levels of performance that the hardware that they're running the performance test on can't actually deliver. So, so they're obviously testing the cache or the m speed of memory in those cases. Uh, and this is really important to, to understand. But the biggest single most important takeaway is almost all of the published results are very hard to uh, make use of for your own levels of applications, especially with microservices where we have um, a large number of dependencies within a system where everything needs to work together. So the, the best way, the, the best single takeaway here is to run your own test in your own environment with your own applications. And if you're trying to do apples to apples comparisons between different providers, run those apples to apples comparisons in, the, in those same environments because um, network, compute, uh, and, and everything else kind of factors in on those tests. So I'll pause over there and hand over to Raffaele, who's going to dazzle you with cloud native disaster recovery. Thank you, Alex. <clears throat> okay, disaster recovery, my favorite topic. Uh, before we delve into the uh, white paper, I wanted to show you these slides, which uh, represents um, the four archetypes that you can um, organize your disaster recovery strategies around. Um, the reality is much more complex than these four diagrams. 
obviously because in your data centers you have multiple applications, they can be using different disaster recovery strategies, they can be dependent on each other, so the reality is much more complex, but if we want to reduce it to a tractable you know, uh, level of a complexity, these are the four things, these are the four patterns that you can use for disaster recovery. And from left to right, they yield, they yield um, better and better mm, <clears throat> performance in terms of the two key metrics for disaster recovery, which are recovery time objective and recovery uh, point objective. So we have um, backup and restore, we have volume replication that could be synchronous and asynchronous. We have transaction level replication where the software, the, the stateful software is organized with a master and a slave or primary and secondary. And then finally we have um, fully distributed workloads. And so if you look at the line at the top, the first three methodologies are active, passive. The last one is active-active. It's, it's the only active-active one. And this is what we focus on in the white paper. This, this last one is what we call cloud-native disaster recovery approach. And the other thing I try to represent in this slide is uh, the capabilities that you need to uh, have available if you want to enable these strategies. So if you think about yourself as a platform engineering that engineer that is trying to decide which capability to have in the platform in order to let the developers or whoever are your customers uh, build their application and run their application. Depending which of these strategies you, you want to support, I try to show the main capabilities uh, that you need. <clears throat> it's interesting that the first two require storage. They're very storage focused. They require storage capabilities like volume replication and backup and restore. But then as, as we move to the right, we need more networking capabilities. And we need some capabilities also in the software, in the, in the stateful workload, as opposed to just relying on, this, on the volumes. And everywhere, we need a global load balancer. Um, so I try to, looking to, to, to find software and open source project, but also um, project that you have to pay for, commercial, commercial so, uh, products that you could use in your platform to build those capabilities. So I'm, I'm not going to go over all of them, but um, I just wanted to point out here that there is this one called Yugabyte. If you were yesterday at the distributed SQL, um, um, so distributed SQL um, meeting, I think it was there at the Marriott just across the street, they were the, the, the one organizing it, and they were showing exactly this type of architecture, and they were showing demos with this type of active-active architecture. Okay. Um, so what do we have in the white paper? Well, first we define this concept of cloud-native disaster recovery, uh, which is essentially this, the active-active diagram that we just saw. Um, so. I'm not going to go over this slide, all of these slides, because we don't have a lot of time. But let's focus on just the last two lines. Uh, who, who is the, the, the disaster recovery owner, process owner in traditional DR? In theory, it's the business uh, unit or the business uh, application team, uh, but because they own the business continuity plan. But normally, they turn to the storage team and they ask, what? What level of DR can you give me? And then they adopt whatever is available. But in, in this new cloud-native DR, they pick the middleware software, so they are the owner of the disaster recovery um, strategy. And the last uh, line is, is more about noticing that as we move toward active-active, we need to focus more on the networking capability to enable <clears throat> this east-west communication between, um, between the instances of our um, state for workload, and then the global balancer. If we, and then the other thing that we do in this white paper is that we look at the <clears throat> CAP theorem. This theorem, you know, there aren't many theorems in IT, uh, so it's, it's important to know the few, the few that exist. And the, the, this theorem is about um, describing the, um, how distributed workloads 
uh, can work. It's about organizing, organizing how the, the possible behavior of, of distributed workload uh, is. And in particular, it says that if, if we want to have distributed workloads, so workloads that is uh, tolerant to network partitioning, you can only have it to be either consistent or available, but it cannot be both. So you have to make a choice when you design your, uh, <clears throat> your software. And then if, if we look at um, this, how this new generation of software that was built on top of the, or, or that was built with the knowledge of the CAP theorem, they, they look all similar. They are organized with replicas for a high availabilities and organized in partitions and, and the partition data for this, for having the ability of scaling um, almost indefinitely. And so they need a coordination layer to, organize, to coordinate the replicas and the partitions. And um, <clears throat> you, can, you can learn a lot about the behavior of this kind of software just by studying how the coordination layer works and what are the protocols that are used um, um, to, for, to do this coordination. And so we did some research. Uh, we took a bunch of this new generation middleware that, was, that are built with the CAP theorem in mind, and we looked at the uh, <coughs> coordination protocol for replicas and for shards or for partitions. So you can, you can take a look at this. There are probably new ones here that now are not in the table. And then we have some reference architecture for how to build this kind of, um, this kind of disaster recovery strategies with uh, strongly consistent workloads. So these are the ones that pick a consistency in the CAP theorem. And then also with eventually consistent workloads, these are the ones that pick availability. So here I have, an, I have a diagram of the uh, strongly consistent one, okay? And in this, when you do this deployment for which you need three failure domains because of the quorum, so at, at least two must be up. So um, this is, uh, anyway, when you do this kind of deployments, if you lose one data center or one uh, cloud region, everything will keep working, okay? Um, you know, the global balancer need to redirect the connections, but beyond that, um, everything keeps, keeps working. You have zero RTO or very, very close to zero RTO, and you have exactly zero RPO. Um, yesterday, by the way, they gave some examples, some real use case with very large deployment uh, across North America, you know, different region in North America. It was, it was very interesting. <clears throat> Uh, so these are the things that we have in the white paper. Um, I'm going to stop here to leave some time for questions. And give the word back to you. So with that, we finish um, our talk. Um, I'm just going to put out a, a final call out. We'd really love to um, have you help us review the documents, work with us, help work with the tag. It's also a great way to find out about projects and um, projects often uh, present at our tag sessions. So it's a, it's a great way to find out about some of the latest things which are happening, not just in, in, this, in you know, the plain storage space, but also for things like databases, operators, key value stores, etc. cetera. Um, and we're also always on the lookout for uh, people who want to actually contribute in a more formal manner and, and, and either become a tech lead or, or, or work with the, with the tag to help with um, the papers that we're working on or, or reviewing projects, et cetera, going forward. So please do reach out. We're available on, uh, on the uh, CNCF Slack. Um, and with that, I will pause for a couple of minutes where we have some time for questions. Okay, then. So thank you all for coming and I uh, hope to see you soon.